Welcome back to Heavy Muscle Radio. I'm Dave Palumbo, and I got my interview of the week on the line. He is a surprise. We've held him in abeyance for way too many months now, and uh, public demand is just too great, and we had to get him back here. He is my old co-host, the original co-host of Heavy Muscle Radio, my good friend and longtime lost brother, John Romano. Welcome. Well, I can't believe I'm I'm finally back on a radio show with you. Yeah, this is like old times. It's like yeah. uh, you know, like you haven't seen someone in like 30 years, you know, and you it's like a reunion almost. <laughs> but uh, this will always this will be better than ever, though. Why cut back? That's our slogan why? now. Better than ever. Why? 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 What? Where did that come from? Why cut back? Where? So, what? Did I, you... I'm going to give you the whole story because John's been a little out of the loop lately. So uh, when I made an announcement. And you had given me this idea, actually, a long, long time ago, but I, I never listened to it. You said, why are you doing contest coverage? You know, you're wasting money. It's very expensive to fly to these shows and to put people up in hotels and feed them and, and ship them around all over the place. And I came to the conclusion, you know, that I was wasting money. Even with a sponsor, I'm losing money doing contest coverage. So I said, I'm going to I'm going to cut back and I'm going to do less coverage. I'm going to just cover the big shows, you know, the important ones. And I'll let, you know, whatever, Blackman or whoever else wants to, you know, I know NPC News Online covers all the shows now and they have, you know, so I let them do that. I, I already proved that I can do it the best. Why do I need to do anything else? So I put this out there. I made the announcement on the radio show. And, and of course, you know, that, you know, you know, uh, as Chris Decito says, the Marcus Welby MD site over there um, heard that <laughs> and Blackman saw it as a weakness and he texted it. Chris Aceto, which he's done a million times. He's tried to steal Chris Aceto from me over the years, at least five wait, or six times. Wait, wait he, he, he knows how to text now? He knows how to text. Either that or Denise at the office texts him. For, you know. yeah. uh, tell me how to text. No, he knows how to text. So he texts Chris this long text, and Chris actually has the text. I can read it to you if you want, but it, let me see if I can find it because it's a gem. It's a gem. He probably, he probably scribbles it out on the yellow pad and red pen. Has Denise type it up? Yeah. And then he reads back to her so that she can text it. <laughs> right, because he wants to make sure that it reads well, of course, right? Right. right. Hold on. I'm going to find this thing. Oh, my God. Are the wind chimes bothering you or should I go to another Yeah, the, you know, I thought the wind I thought I was hearing bells. I started worrying that I might be going senile because my dad is losing <laughs> his mind. So the bells are on your end. Yeah, if you could I don't know if you could get rid of the bells. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go into another room. You like Ronnie Coleman. I had Ronnie Coleman on Heavy Muscle TV and he went and answered the doorbell while he was doing the interview with us. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably, he was probably making bank deposits too. Yeah, probably. Who knows? Pulling up the, better. Yes, yes. I was. I, I literally. I did think I was going crazy. <clears throat> no, I was in my office up on the roof, and uh, I have I have a, a pergola up there, and I hung some wind chimes off it. So it's while you know, I'm looking nice. for this. Tell us where you're living now, because a lot of people ask me where the hell is Romano. I said he's in Mexico, I, but I don't know where you are in Mexico. I, I'm, I'm in Guadalajara. I'm actually in in a in a suburb of Guadalajara called Zapopan. And I live at actually at the end of that on the on the road to to Puerto Vallarta. So my gym is about a 15 minute ride towards town and the beach is a three hour ride the other way. So I'm kind of like uh, at the base of the mountains is where I would be in a kind of nice. Um, they call them cotos here. There would be the equivalent of a gated community in the United States. So it's a kind of a planned development with, you know, um, different style architecture behind a wall and you have to get through a guard gate and stuff to get there. So it's, uh, you know, it's safe, it's quiet and, and uh, you know, it's just close enough to town so that it's not a hassle to get there, but far enough away so that you don't have to deal with any of the, you know, crowding and hassle of, of being in the city. Now, what, you know, what was the impetus to go to Mexico of all places? I know you lived there years ago and I know you liked it, but what, why Mexico? I mean, it, it almost sound, it looks like to people that you're like running away from something. <laughs> actually i'm going to be running back soon because i'm so i'm out of my mind here but initially well when i did live here you know i lived at the beach i lived in puerto vallarta so i had a um i had a sort of resort mentality and you know i was making money i met my i was making money in the united states making dollars and spending pesos down in mexico so it was a very different economic 
uh, environment than it is now that where I'm, you know, owning a business in, in Mexico, Mexico, not, right. not resort Mexico, Guadalajara, there's no tourism in Guadalajara or very little of it. And, and, you know, we're actually running a business in, and in, in pesos, you know, making pesos, spending pesos. And, and, um, it's very, it's very, very different. The reason I came here this time was, um, apart from Obama being elected, <laughs> the reason I, I uh, came down this time is, uh, I, you know, I had the opportunity to buy this gym from, from my friend and, um, I did. And, uh, we ended up, we ended up, uh, you know, running that and, and, you know, uh, actually ended up selling that and, and, and moving into a by upgrading, buying them to another one that uh, was much bigger. So now we have, now we have like forty thousand square feet on three floors. We have wow. about four hundred and fifty pieces of equipment. A uh, big Olympic pool. We're doing some remodeling now to make it even. Oh, that's uh, a huge even, gym. Now, what is what, now? What does a gym like that cost to work at it in in Mexico? What do you charge like monthly? We we have two <laughs> we have two different much more expensive than the United States. It is people. really yeah much more. Um, we we char we get for a year membership we get about. Uh, Four forty five hundred pesos, which is about uh, three hundred bucks. Oh wow! That's and um, if, yeah. and if and if you want to go monthly, you got to pay a, an inscription of about uh, inscription is about a hundred bucks, and you end up paying about um, fifty bucks a month. So you probably have a lot of wealthy people working out there. I'm assuming. No, no. <laughs> How do you? It's it, Mexico is interesting. How it's, do poor people afford that? That's a lot of money. There's a huge middle class now, and the middle class is is uh, is making money. You know, Mexico is is you know is working on the global economy now, and it's not it's no longer you know it used to be the workshop for America. Now China right. is, and Mexico's yeah. got its own it's got its own economic driving force. Plus, the, you know, the 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 drug empire down here is is monumentally huge. Oh, so that's and, who's working out. You got all the drug. Deals, well, huh? well, it creates business. I mean, there's yeah. a, you can see this city right from here called Andares, which is got these beautiful ultra modern you know 40 floor skyscrapers and a big mall with you know pf changs and 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 uh, cheesecake factory and really? sushi mm -hmm. bars and yeah. all this stuff and it's 100% financed by cartel money i didn't know that that's interesting yeah, yeah. so the, all the and you know so all the businesses in the malls and the all the business, all the cottage businesses that, that build up around it construction you know engineering architecture all of these industries have gotten a tremendous boost from the you know, hundreds of millions of dollars is pumped into this country from the drug cartels. Yeah. So the middle class has gotten a, a big boost economically. And they, can, they you know, everybody's driving around here in BMWs and Mercedes. And Are you serious? So I, I never would have seen that. Like, I went to Tijuana last year for like or two years ago for a show. Like, I never, I never would have imagined that there are places in Mexico that are like, like, oh, this like Long Island, basically. You got to remember the richest man in the world is a Mexican. True. But that's and only lives, one person. Well, yeah, but and he lives here. So, you know, but where he and lives. And his name's not Steve Blackman. <laughs> <laughs> Although Blackman's trying to climb the ladder. I, yeah. I, 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 I'm, I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to read you the text message that he sent to Chris. So uh, Blackman okay. sends this text message to Chris Aceto the day after I make that announcement on the radio, which tells you, obviously, Blackman listens to the radio. We know that. Biting his nails. Hi, Chris. <laughs> Sorry to hear that Dave had to let a lot of people go because of the fall of advertising, plus cut back on contest coverage. MD is number one multimedia destination for bodybuilding, while competitors are cutting print copies from 12 to 8. MD will continue to print 12 issues in 2015. We make money on each issue. Why cut back? It doesn't pay. Wishing you the best. That was the text message. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Why cut back? Dave, when you and I were at MD, the MD was 560 pages. Right. Now it's 160. Yeah. No, and, so, and, and also he's at least gotten rid of 75% of the athletes he had on the contract. At least. Jose yeah. Raymond, uh, you know, all these guys that he had on the contract. I mean, the list – I can give you a list that goes on for forever. Rex Wheeler, you know, Dorian Yates, all those guys that he pulled in aren't with him anymore. Lavroni, uh, you know. I, mean, I think Lavroni still is. I talked to him the other day. Oh, he is maybe. I don't know. Yeah, but Flex isn't. I, I don't think he is because Lavroni interviewed with me at the uh, FIBO. And he, oh, did he? Yeah, yeah. Oh, he probably just got canned then because I talked to him a couple. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people well, got canned. 
<clears throat> like Aaron Clark, all, all the little, you know, all the people that he loved having on his payroll there. So yeah, it's trophies. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that yeah, that was that. That's where the whole why cut where the whole why cut back because I thought it was so funny that that he would be saying why cut back while he's cutting back. He let go of Valentino. I mean, you saw the Valentino TV show. Yeah, no, I mean this. I think this creates a, a great environment to us to bring. Uh, to us to bring heavy muscle radio back and get Valentino and you and me and, and Jimmy right. the Bull, Mr. G, get everybody back together. That's what the fans are screaming for, bro. I know. We definitely have to have at least a reunion show, but uh, we do. I had um, uh, Valentino on my one of my Ask Dave TV shows, and you know, I just let him go on and on and on and fed him, you know, question after question. People were just loving it. I mean, because. He's just, you know, he was basically under restraining order, basically, when he was with MD. So he couldn't really do what he wanted to do. Yeah, he had he contacted me on a fake Facebook <laughs> account just so he could talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Uh, but anyway, that that's the whole Blackman thing. So, yeah, I, I don't know what his what his what his shtick is. I mean, he you know, he's he's losing money. There's no way that magazine's making money. And, you know, he lie. You know, he lies about the the uh, distribution. He probably prints tw- the 50,000 copies, but he sells like, you know, 3000 copies. No, I, I had it. Well, I, I had an advertiser here, that, that, a friend of mine um, called Blackman to talk to him about advertising. I, mean, I guess he talked to Angela yeah. and uh, She's still doing the same shtick from you know 15 years ago that doesn't work. That 150,000 M- copies. They're still no worse. M- MD is number one in Barnes and Noble. Give <laughs> a fuck about Barnes and Noble. <laughs> Does, I thought Barnes and Noble closed, didn't they? Yeah, it's the Barnes. It's it's not. You gotta you gotta pick between the lines. You know how Blackman is. He, he'll, he'll, he'll distort anything. Yeah. It's the Barnes and Noble near his house where there's one issue <laughs> on the stand because he brings it there, and then he goes so, and buys it probably, and somebody buys it. So it's yeah. the number one selling bodybuilding <laughs> magazine because it sells out every month because he only had one issue. So. <laughs> it's not, Barnes and Noble. This, the chain is gone. They collect all the ones in Florida are closed. Yeah. And he goes saying that it's the industry standard. It's the industry standard for for magazine distribution. ABC is the interest in industry standard for well, magazine distribution, not Barnes and Noble or Blackman's neighborhood Barnes and Noble. Yeah. <laughs> Look, you know he's in his own world over there. But how could? But how is it possible that he continues to bamboozle the advertisers? What advertisers? He's got he's got a hundred pages left of the magazine. There's, there's yeah, nothing just, there. I mean, there's, he's got he's still got something, you know. And he's been yeah. he's been lying to these people for years. And what happens is it ruins it for yeah. the for legitimate magazines that have advertising potential because they'll say, hey, you know, we tried print and it didn't work. Well, well, who'd you try? Well, we went with MD. Well, of course. You know, well, you, you, know, you and I both know we said this five, six years ago that that print is is really dead. Who who goes who under the age of 30 reads magazines? No one. These no. kids don't. Do you know that I have hired kids to do some video? editing? I can't find a kid who can work a computer anymore. These if, the, if these kids do everything on their phone, they have apps yeah. that like do Photoshop and yeah, and, and make videos and i'm like i can't even believe it no, no one even wants to use a computer anymore i that's, feel like i'm old because here. i got a laptop you know that's that's here in mexico 80 percent of the people who are online are on their iphone it's not computers nobody's got a computer yeah that's why we that's why everything on rx muscle now is catered to you know to watch right. on your phone we have uh, everything all the live original tv programming we do is on live stream we have a live stream pro account you can pull the live stream app up or you can watch it right from the front page of rxmuscle.com but, because I know that if you can't watch it on your phone, no one will watch it. As a matter of fact, I sit home, I don't know if you have Apple TV, and I stream my iPhone to my Apple TV and I watch all the video on there. Yeah, yeah, I have I have that. But you know, I, I, I am the managing editor of Muscle Insider Magazine, so I have to defend print here for a second. <laughs> It's you know there there still is and probably always will be and you know a certain prestige to print because anybody can get published online. I mean my dog can get published right. online, but you know magazines still have a little you know bit of prestige left because they you know they are print and they have they're held to a higher standard and you know that's why Bruce Jenner chose uh, Vanity Fair over you know the, yeah you know, I guess I, you know I, I think in Canada and Mexico South America they still read magazines to a certain degree. I think in the U.S. it's really, you know, aside from the uh, the tabloids and stuff like that, I don't think anyone reads anything. Well, you know, it, you're you're right, and and any any good media company is 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 going to be over the next you know decade or so 
you know, gradually rolling out of print and putting more of their, you know, creative and, and you know, media resources into, into online. It's just a natural progression. Yeah. It's, it's the way it's going to go. But, you know, you got to roll with that. The companies that are rolling with it are going to survive. The ones that don't are going are gonna to die. Yeah. I, I, th- to be honest with you, I don't care what Blackman's got in his way of advertising. There's no way contest coverage pays. I know, first of all, I know he pays double whatever it would cost me to do contest coverage because he's got, you know, prima donnas working over there. Uh-huh. And uh, it's expensive. I mean, I, there's no business model. If you cover like three or four shows a month, you're losing money. Even if you bring in ten grand a month in for advertising for contest coverage, you can't do it. it doesn't cover it. It just Dave, doesn't no one, cover it. No one did guerrilla contest coverage like we did. Remember no. driving in, in your car with the with the laptops with the with the charger <laughs> that I had to run the one ten, right. <laughs> putting the, video up while we're driving ninety miles an hour on the Jersey Turnpike. Yeah, off the I cigarette mean, lighter. Yeah, what, with the cigarette right, the cigarette lighter power source. We did it. I mean, we did it all, but. But that's what my, that's my point to you when I when I you know suggested that let Blackman spend all his money on contest coverage. If you want to cover a contest, there's plenty of of um, you know freelance photographers that have shot the show that you can buy the photos from. We, we, I don't even care. I don't. You know what? To t- tell you the truth is, I, our contest coverage. I should say our our website traffic since I stopped doing like contest coverage of. Although I do the major shows, I I somehow wind up at the major shows. I don't know how. Like this past weekend at the Arnold Brazil, uh, a client of mine flew me in, so I just happened to be there. So we seem to be covering all the major shows anyway. I don't I haven't lost any traffic. If anything, the traffic went up because our our all our live streamed programming is increasing. So I truly believe the future. And I said this to you when we first started that it was going to be internet TV and original right. programming because no one else is doing that. And we and we originally started to be a, a, a media company. I don't I don't know how we got sidetracked into contest coverage, yeah, but because yeah. <laughs> we did, you know what the problem is? We did it so well, and we were the only authentic right. people doing it that no one wanted to hear anyone else doing it. Um, you know, now obviously, you know, NPC News has got a great uh, a great angle on it because what they do is they don't really send people to the shows except the big ones, but they have like a network of, of photographers they're using. And then what they do is they tell the promoters, Hey, look, send us the pictures since we're the official, you know, uh, I guess you could say, uh, you know, uh, awesome. We're the, uh, we're the organizational website. So I go there and I look at the, and I look at the pictures for the smaller shows. You know, I had a network of photographers all over the country working with me, but you know, I had to pay, even if you pay them a hundred bucks each, it adds up these shows. And then I got the worst part is getting someone to tag the shows. It, it right. wastes, it wastes resources for millions of hours. Yeah. Well, you know, NPC news, it does an amazing job of it. And, and technically that should be theirs anyway. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's their gig. It's, it's like, you know, MLB having their own, yeah. you know, you, you know, outlet or, you know, auto racing, they do the same thing for formula one. It's, yeah. con, it's confined to the, 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 you know, the, the, it, the governing body seems like it has an adjunct media source and that's the, what they should use. They have the best access. Yeah. They have the best ever of every, everybody. And, and they're going to get it first because they're in control. So yeah, definitely let them do it. They do it better than anybody. Yeah. That's what I say. But entertainment, come on. Who, who what, what show in the, in the, History of, of bodybuilding entertainment has had more people begging for it to come back than heavy muscle radio yeah. with the wet pack, the original. Yeah. Well, that I think it was the after hour show that people really that loved. That too. Yeah. <laughs> that was the, the – and, and, and people don't realize that, you know, there was no – I had no studio. We, we had, There was no Skype. What we would do is we would jam six or seven people into my computer room, which was very small, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and we would have these microphones spread about, and it was, I think it was me, you, Jeff, the producer, Mr. G, the white Biggie Smalls, his brother, Pelletia, <laughs> and then we would have these people that just would float in out Derek, of nowhere, like Anthony, Diego and... Diego, Derek Anthony would yeah, come in. Yeah, yeah. We had, uh, yeah, it was his birthday the other day, by the way. I know, yeah, I two, felt bad that, you know, it's, it's, isn't it, you know, look, we talked about this years ago that Derek probably wouldn't live a long life because he was yeah. so insane, and it's it's sad that he's no longer around. I do miss him. I do miss him. I want to have an empty chair for him in the studio when we yeah. come back. <laughs> All right, let you know what. Let's talk about what happened to John Romano. The dem- I call it the demise of, of John Romano, but like a phoenix rising, you're coming back. Actually, speaking of phoenix rising, you know, the Miss Olympia uh, has been is not being held this year, and right. uh, the, the guys from Wings of Strength. Or I say guy and girl, a couple who own Wings Park, of Strength. Yeah. 
They are bringing back a show like the Olympia. They're calling it the Phoenix Rising Show, ironically enough. <laughs> and it'll be held in Texas. And it's going to be like the Miss Olympia. They're going to be, I think they're giving away like 50 grand in prize money, maybe a car I heard something wow. about. So um, that, I thought that was pretty interesting. Anyway, yeah. let's get back to you. John Romano, what happened to John Romano? People ask me that all the time because you know what? People's memory is very short. They don't remember what happened. Uh, what year was it that um, that you left? Do you remember? Well, I'm, is to, it 11? I'm gonna, I'll give you to the nutshell first. And to all do right. that, I have to quote Mr. Olympia Dexter Jackson, who I saw at the Nationals in Miami, who said, dude, you done fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> and if Dexter told you that, you know it's true. Yeah, you know, um, it is, and that, and that's it is. That is the truth. I mean, and, and the short story is that's the truth. So, um, you want to pick it apart? I'm more than happy yeah, to well, do it. I think that look, this is look. I I've made we we were considered. I guess you can call us radicals when we first started because we had no angle. We had right. no money. Our angle was let's put it out there, the truth out there. And I, and I still champion the truth. But sometimes the truth has to be restrained a little bit because people's feelings get hurt. There's business involved. And let's face it, we are oper- everyone is operating inside the IFBB and NPC's playground. And it's their playground rules. And if you don't like the rules, you can leave. People right. complain all the time. They don't like the judging. They don't like this. Then you don't have to compete here. And just like uh, you know, I was told many times, and it's the truth, I don't need to – they don't need me, you know, covering their shows in their playground if I don't want to play by their rules. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that, you know, we would get in trouble every once in a while. I still get in trouble every once in a while. And that's, look, that's part of the thing. It's like, you know, getting, you know, spanked by your parent, you know, when you're a kid, if you, if you get a little too unruly. So we towed the line a lot. And I think that you got, I don't remember what the exact situation was. I believe it had something to do with the Mr. Olympia contest. You had criticized something about it. And I believe Robin Chang got very upset. I think Jim Mannion just had enough. And I think he was just in a – he was a little irritated about us anyway. And I think it, it just pushed him over the edge. And I, and I think that, that that was the final straw. Am I right? Yeah. It was the final straw on both sides, I guess you could say. Because, um, <clears throat> you know, my reaction to that was that of, you know, the, the a camel's back, back break. And, you know, I, I, I lost control basically, you know, I mean, what I had been going on in my personal life up and up until that point, you know, I just got in full custody of my son. I was, I would, you know, I'd been exhausted, you know, and after an exhaustive 10 year legal battle, it cost me every penny I had almost, uh, I mean, my dad dying, my, you know, uh, you know, us trying to, you know, pull out of the problems we, we were having with, with them to begin with, you know, that, that radicalized us. So all of those things together, you know, when that when I was, you know, kind of pushed on, put on standby, I reacted very, very badly. You know, I um, I guess you, I don't know. I, I think I snapped. I, I, <laughs> there was definitely a loss of control, which is, you know, very rare for me. Um, and that's what happened. You know, well, I mean, I you were, let, let, let's let's lay it out. I mean, you're, you're sugarcoating it. You were you had just gotten custody of your son. You were in this horrible marriage that, uh, you know where you felt your son was being mistreated. You had to, not only did you take custody of him, but you were fighting over different things with the ex, uh, that was stressed out. You were not making money. We had just gotten, you know, fired from MD and, and the site really wasn't making money and, and you were having financial difficulties and nothing's worse than having to support a child with no finances. And I, I knew this, I felt your stress. You were living in my house for a while in my rental house. And so right. I knew that you were very, very stressed out and that didn't help. And, you know, and then we, you know, we had advertisers, but you know, people were trying to blacklist us everywhere we went. I'm not talking about the organization. I'm talking about Steve Blackman and people were bad mouthing us. Don't advertise with those guys. And that was, you know, that was a stressful time in my life too. I mean, I lost a relationship too during that period of time. Sure. So right. I understand where you're coming from. I, tend to be a little bit more politically savvy sometimes than you do, you know, you just, you know, sometimes opened your mouth. And I think what happened was you, you, whatever the case may be, whatever the final straw was, uh, rather than laying low. And I, I think I had even advised you, let's just take it easy for a while. I think you just went nuts basically. And you went, yeah, did. And you went on the attack, um, in hindsight and retrospect. And I know that you, over the years, you and I revisited this and you still were very angry about it. I, I feel like all of a sudden you, you know, recently you've gotten remorseful about what you did. Is that, would that be an accurate depiction? 
except recently is a little bit longer than just, you know, very, I mean, over the last couple of years, you know, so I'd been, say a year and a half, two years. Yeah. Yeah. yeah about yeah. at least two years, you know, I've been trying to, yeah. I mean, you know, one is I, I realized, you know, after, you know, being away, you know, when you're, when you're away from something, you realize what you miss. And, you know, I've been in this industry for almost 30 years now. So it's this, I don't know anything else. This is my, this is my home. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, while I had aspirations of moving on and, you know, leaving this behind me and pursuing something else, the reality is, is th this is where this, this is my home. This is where I've yeah. been. And so, uh, you know, I know the most about this. I know uh, that this is where I want to be and to be ostracized and to be on the outside looking in at where, you know, I formerly was, you know, was uh, not not a very pleasant feeling. And yeah, remorseful is is kind of mild in how you put it, because it's just not not remorseful for me for what for what I was feeling, about, but remorseful for the relationships that I damaged and, and destroyed, you know, in the wake of it, you know, with, you know, Steve Weinberger and, and Jim Mannion and Robin Chang. And, you know, Weinberger is I, I like the guy, you know, I mean, I, I always liked him. I went to his gym. He comp my membership. We used to talk cars all the time. You know, for me to now be as, you know, persona non grata in his eyes is 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 well, painful. Well, you know that Steve is 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 the kind of guy that will always tell you what he feels. He'll never hold back. And I think that, you know, when you di disrespect to him is something that he will not tolerate. Um, right. And, you know, and that that's that's I know a lot of guys like that. I can name that are like that. I unfortunately maybe to my own device i i accept into i i will accept people's disrespect a little bit more i'm more tolerant of that but he has no tolerance zero tolerance and i you know what i respect that about him because you know what he sticks to his guns he doesn't care if he's got to lose business he doesn't care if he's going to lose a friendship he doesn't care if he's going to lose a political alliance to him his you know respect is everything and i think that when you disrespected him and whatever you said about him, I don't remember the exact details, and there's no reason to even go into it at this right. point. I know you've pulled it all off the internet since then, and and you've you know tried to you know post retractions. Um, I think that he he in his mind completely erased you. Um, right. What if you had a, if you were talking to him now, if he was listening, what what would you say to him? I mean, if you had to you know if you had to talk to him and address him about what went down and and how you feel about that now. You know, if I had that opportunity, and, and you know, I and I, I hope someday I do, is that I I just want to you know apologize for my loss of control, Dave, is what it is because I feel about you know respect the same way he does, and you know when I was you know I was in that situation and felt the way I felt, I, I you know I kind of left all reason behind and went like you know out of my mind, so you know for me, all of you know, my tact and my decorum and my, you know, ability to maintain, which is, are things that, you know, I hold pretty dear to me. It's it just kind of indicative of, of, you know, how, you know, off I was thrown by this whole thing. And, you know, the, the ensuing damage, it's like, you know, drunks when they crash their car and they're blacked out, they have no memory of it. You right. know, it's, it's kind of like a blind, a blind rage I went into. And, right. you know, I, I feel terrible for having done that. I feel worse for having lost control you know, in the aftermath than for, than for anything else because of the damage that it did. And it's irreparable. I mean, I said terrible things about him. I said terrible things about, you know, Mannion, Robin Chang, I think all things I wish I could take back, but it was, you know, heat of the moment. And I feel horrible that I was, I allowed myself to get that caught up in how I was feeling like emotionally, like, 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 uh, you know, out of control. Is is the best way I can I can describe it. I think that you know your the, the problem with you is that you're so, uh, I guess you could say, uh, articulate and articulating when you're when you have a, a, a animosity towards someone that it actually makes it worse because some <laughs> people who might not be able to write as well or articulate how they feel as well would be better off because they wouldn't say the things that you said uh, because I think you were trying to almost personally you know I think you were trying to really hurt them you know, from a psychological standpoint. Yes, and I, I, I felt, I felt hurt and I wanted to hurt back as bad as I felt. So, so, so here's the question. Why should they forgive you? Why should Jim Mannion and, and Steve Weinberger and Robin Chang say, you know what, I'm going to give this guy another chance. What, what, what would, in your mind, how would you, if you were a lawyer, you know, in court, what would be the reason that we should give John Romano another chance? They probably shouldn't. 
But, uh, you know, if I could plead my case, you know, the, uh, it, it's, you know, <laughs> I, it, it, you're, you're right. It, as being an articulate person to be able to try to, you know, paraphrase the, a multitude of emotions that go into, you know, what I would want to what I would want to say is this is that I am remorseful. I'm I'm I blew up. I, I lost my head and I said some terrible things that I wish I could take back. But I, I want and, you know, I, what I want to do is is, uh, you know, give back to this community and this industry in the most positive way possible and use that you know, whatever abilities I have to make the industry a better place. I, and that, that I would want that chance to do that. You know? I think personally that the greatest punishment that they inflicted upon you was banishment really, yeah. at this point. And I think that, you know, look, I, you know, I'm a big believer in that, you know, people have to, you know, be accountable for what they do and say. And I, I, I truly believe that you've suffered for long enough and that, you know, that's why I wanted to, you know, do this interview with you because I, I feel that, you know, you know, at some point that, I'm all about forgiveness. I forgive pretty much everyone. I had I had a kid who who robbed my house years ago, and I was one of it was one of my better friends. And uh, I didn't talk to him obviously after that for 15 years. And then I found out he had cancer and he was dying. And, and I called him up and I, I forgave him on the phone. Wow. Uh, and I'm glad I did that before you know he wanted and he did have, un, unfortunately eventually wound up dying. And it was a terrible thing. And I and I and I realized that you know what we were so foolish. We were all friends. We were, I was friends with right. him and his his brothers. And and you know we lost that because of one stupid move on his part. Whatever you know, I don't want to go into the motivations of why he did it or anything like that. But and I don't really even know the motivations. But the the, the bottom line is it was just ridiculous. It, it was just one act. And you know I lost 15 years with this guy because of it. And you know at this point you know you've been out of the sport now for five years or more. And you know I think that the sport would be better with you there reporting on it, giving your, you know, witty insights and, and, and helping to, you know, the sport to evolve to a point where we could all be proud at some point in the future. And I, I, I hope, you know, that, that, you know, that Steve and Robin and, and Jim and, and JM could, could forgive you at some point and maybe understand that, you know what, this is your life. This is your passion. You love doing it. Look, you don't need the money anymore. You know, you're, you're, you're very well off financially, but you, but this is what you are passionate about. When you take away someone's, passion and ability to do what they love it's almost like you don't even want to live anymore you know yeah, it's 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 being on you're the nail on the head is the, is the ostrac is being ostracized you know being ostracized from the industry that you've been with your entire adult life and um you know in retrospect when i go back and replay this in my mind and think about it and i think of what what must i have you know gone through my head to do you know to say what i have said and, and you know just in my own estimation, just despicable is the is the best adjective I I can come up with to describe, you know, my actions. And and you know, I'm a reasonable guy. And in looking at that, thinking to myself, holy crap, you know, what must I have been going through in my head to do act like that, which is you know totally out of character I, for me. Yeah, I've never seen you that irrational, to be honest with you, because you oh. know I I had many talks with John, and I'm just going to put it out there, and I and I and I try to like, you know, before you went crazy, I said let's not get hasty let's not do this i think you know one let's have a sit down let's and you just just it was like you were like a different person like you just were like having no part of it you were like in in war warfare mentality like you know that's it i broke dave yeah. you know yeah, i mean that's what it comes down to i snapped yeah and you know I, I guess you know with everything that i was going on in my personal life this was just like I, I, I couldn't take it, you know. It was it was like the, it was the thing that it was. You can pile on as much you can as you can pile on top of a person, and eventually they snap. I mean, it happens a lot, and it that was that was what happened to me. The the unfortunate part was that I did not heed the advice of the people around me, like you, who was you know feeding me you know really good you know uh, intentions, and that's what I should have done. I should have listened to you. I should have been rational. I should have done what I would have done in, in a in a clear head, laid low, let it blow over, come back, you know, and you know try to talk it out. You know, I, I, I I'm the one who reached out, you know, to Jim Mannion, you know, maybe like two years ago because somebody asked me. You know, if if I if I was gonna knew I was gonna die tomorrow, what what regrets would I be leaving the world with? 
And the, the top of the list was bad blood. I, I would want to leave with no bad blood, no bad blood with Mannion, who I've always respected and admired, you know, through the entire career, my entire career. I always thought I had a, a good relationship with him. Weinberger, the, th those two guys specifically, you know, people who they have been in my life in one capacity right. or another in, 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 a, in a way that was, you know, uh, you, knew Steve, you knew Steve from a different perspective because when you were married to Shelly Beatty, she was competing against Bear Francis. So you guys yes. would be sitting in the uh, pit together, I'm sure, at the shows. I, you know, and 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 uh, you know, it was funny. I I did a I did you know I've interviewed him for his you know with, you know for articles for his promoting his gym. I was I always promoted Bev's gym as you know the top you know East Coast mecca, the the, the best gym, one of the best gyms I've ever been in in my life, e even today. You know, um, I respect them as a gym owner. I'm in the same business now, and I certainly have a you know a greater respect for you know what they've been able to accomplish and maintain uh, you know over the years. Gym business is tough, man. For you to survive, for you to survive in the gym business, you're a you definitely got it got it going on. And and uh, you know all all of those attributes that go with these people, Jimmy too, are, you know are are you know guys who have, who have created a tremendous amount of success in this industry by building and maintaining a very efficient, well-oiled machine right. that should be respected. And, and I lost sight of that, and, and I thought I was, you know, Because, you know, the tr in, in defense of, of, of Jim and Steve, they, they do let us criticize, you know, judging. They do let us criticize the shows. I mean, they, I, very rarely do I get a phone call yelling at me unless I've gone completely overboard. So they, they allow critiques of what's going on. It's not like we can't do that. I think it's when they feel that the business is being jeopardized, like in other words, where you know where, where you're like inciting, uh, you know, anarchy or something like that, or or revolution, that's when they get they, they they realize that we've crossed the line. And look, I've I've gone a little too far, and I've apologized, you know, before, yeah. and I've gotten spanked, and I've lost press passes, and you know, I I suck it up, and I hate it. You know, sometimes I my dad once told me this. He goes, sometimes you have to learn to to take your uh, punishment, even though if you don't think it's deserved or justified right. that's, that's the that's the uh he said that's the sign that you're truly mature uh, a mature adult because you know what you don't always get what you want he said and, and and you know what when he told me that it made sense and even though i didn't like accepting it i said to myself he's right and so when i you know get punished for whatever reason whoever whether it would be uncle sam or the federal court system or Jim Mannion or whoever, I accept the punishment. I move on and I, and I, and I allow my life to, you know, evolve around whatever the decision is. And, you know, I realize that I don't have control of everything and sometimes surrendering to what's going on is the best method. And I think that you probably learned in, in retrospect, in hindsight, you probably should have just resigned yourself to whatever was going on at the moment and not reacted so strongly. That's true. Absolutely that. But, you know, also, Dave, it's, it's the power of positive. I think that all they're really looking for is, is positive. I mean, if I, everything that came out of my mouth about the organization that I've ever said was positive and that, you know, whatever criticism I had about it or, or argument or complaint I had about it, I just kept it to myself or, or yeah. coached, couched it in a way that it wasn't adversarial. And you can always keep things positive, even if you're complaining. You know, but, sure. uh, you know, I, I let my, uh, you know, I let my, um, you know, hot headedness get, get the best of me at that point. And, you know, that's unfortunately, you know, you combine you combine, uh, you know, a short fuse or, or a, not, not my fuse isn't really short, but when my fuse gets lit, then it's too late. Yeah. You combine that with, you know, being articulate and having a good vocabulary and, you know, the tongue becomes a carving knife. And yeah. I carved the path of destruction through my uh, through my career. And that's. You know what? I, in, in hindsight, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Dave, there's a lot of things I wish I could take back. But moving forward, you know, I would just like to be. You know, you, you asked me why they should forgive me, and you know, you said, you know, the industry is better with me in it than not. And I, I, I kind of think that I still have, you know, a decent following, and it, you know, in the industry, I put a, you know, every time I put up an article, it gets you know six figure views, and um, you know, I'm still relevant in that regard. And I should be able. All I want to do is to be able to use that reach. And the notoriety, whatever notoriety I've built over the years to promote the sport that I love the best way possible. And that's all I ever should have wanted to do. And, um, you know, I got sidetracked and 
it, it's really unfortunate what happened, and I and I, I just hope that someday these guys can, you know, forgive me and, and give me a chance to, to prove that this is really where my heart is and, you know, move forward. What, what do you think about the industry right now? What, what do you, th- when you see the industry, I mean, it's changed dramatically over the last five years since, you know, you were with RX Muscle. Uh, there's bikini, there's women's physique, there's um, men's physique now. Uh, how do you see the industry evolving? What's the Romano perspective on it? My perspective is is that is that in any situation you you have to be able to adapt. And as public sentiment and and what the public deems acceptable evolves, if you're catering to to the to the appeal of of the of the masses, you have to evolve along with that. And you know, I'm the guy that can remember standing in Madison Square Garden in the Felt Forum in 1990 90 or 89 or 90, you know, with Corey Everson as Miss Olympia to a sellout crowd and, and, and in the Felt Forum as with the Miss Olympia as a standalone event. Who would have dreamed that 20, 25 years later it would be gone? Right. You know, so, you know, it's gone because the tastes have matured. The, the, the industry has grown. People have changed. The, the, the technology with which the sport is practiced has increased and, and been perfected and, and has moved forward. So, yeah, the sport has evolved. And I think the, the, the Federation has done a tremendous job of, of rolling with it instead of, you know, you know, I mean, women's bodybuilding is a great perspective, although it's, you know, sad on one hand that we're we're sad to see it go from a business perspective. It's something that had to go. And it's, it's, it's been replaced. I wouldn't say it's been replaced. I think you said it's a reboot. It's, you know, to have it's, it's evolved essentially. Yeah. Yeah. It's evolved. And now we have bikini physique, figure fitness. We have many more, you know, disciplines for women to follow, to be accepted. And I think this men's physique is an absolutely tremendous, uh, you know, idea when it first came out, I kidded about it. I called it men's bikini. I thought it was, you know, a, a lower form of competition, you know, next to women's bikini. And then I realized this is what people want to look like. Right. There's very few guys, although we would all say, oh, I would love to look like Dave Palumbo looked in his prime, you know. Yeah, for a couple of days, but, you know, forever. I don't <laughs> You didn't even want to look no. like that. Ever, no. you know, so, um, you know, it, it, it's I think they've offered something now. And, and the proof is in the proof is in the is in the uh, is in the is in the execution. Dave, men's fitness is the fastest growing faction of the of the IFBB and the NPC. Yeah, well, I've said it before. I think that there should be a third division. They had 18 divisions in the women's side. I think they should add another division for the men where it would be halfway between men's physique and men's bodybuilding. It would be a, like a classic men's bodybuilding where the guys would have physique-like looks, but they would be able to pose. They would be able to show their legs. Because you know what? Look, I don't want, I'm the last person to want to see another division because these shows take too long as it is. But you know what? <laughs> If you have four or five divisions in the women's side of the sport, uh, men deserve at least three. They need, and I think that there's a lot of men's physique guys that are competing that do have legs. They do want to pose, and that maybe they don't look the best standing there, but when they're moving, they look impressive. And so I think, you know, I know everyone's saying, no, 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 we're not doing it, but probably within the next year or two or three, we'll see another division. I, I think it's it's a natural progression. I, I, and I, I think it would, they would be crazy not to. What it is is that there is they are a business, and you, you cannot run a business with your sentiments and with your heart. You've got to run a business with your head. While we may love women's bodybuilding from an artistic and, you know, aesthetic perspective, business-wise, it's not cutting it. So they made a decision, but the other decisions that went along with that to grow to where they've grown now, back when back when bodybuilding was just a men's alone event, when then you know the addition of women's bodybuilding was a two event contest, nobody made any money. Now it's now you've got a situation where instead of ten or twenty people you know entering a show, you've got four and five hundred on the or more. Uh, a thousand on the on the national level right. and these these are this is attracting it's growing the sports attracting more people and the more divisions they put in the more the more chances you get the more you have a niche to showcase your particular kind of physique 
it, they should include it because it's going to draw more people into it, add more eyeballs to, to our side of the world and increase exponentially everybody's, you know, income and, and, and notoriety and, and, uh, and exposure right along with it. It's are, good for everybody. So, are, there, are there too many pro cards? Because it seems like everyone's a pro nowadays. Is, do you think that that might be too much? I know that obviously the more people that compete, you got to give more pro cards. So says the you know the, the the conventional wisdom. But is there has the pro card lost its prestige? You remember when back in the nineties, eighties, and nineties, you knew every single IFBB pro. There was not one per person that you didn't know who they were because there were so few pro cards given. It was only men's and women's bodybuilding. Nowadays, you could run into an IFBB pro bikini girl, you wouldn't know who she was or that she was an IFBB pro. The beer tub girl at Hooters. Yeah, I mean you know the, it's it's. Uh, you know, I use that analogy a lot, and although Hooters doesn't have beer tub girls, but you know the Rock Bar or wherever you want to go, um, <laughs> South Florida. Yeah, you know, there's I have I'm I have uh, two trains of thought on that. I'm, I'm kind of on the fence from a, from a from an athlete's perspective. I think you know from a male bodybuilder looking at a, who's striving for a pro card, looking at you know some of these girls who who uh, you know. Uh, don't really look like they do very much uh, by comparison to what a guy bodybuilder has to go through. And they're getting the same pro card. I could see him having a little bit of a sour taste in his mouth saying, man, I got to work a hundred times harder than this girl. And she's got the same pro card I do and the same pro privileges and the same pro bragging rights. And to, to that extent, maybe bikini is not the best division to offer pro cards in. They should just be like kind of a, uh, uh, exhibition style show well, with no pro division. I, what roles. about what about if they come out with like an elite pro card? You know, like for like people who have placed top five at the Olympia or the Arnold Classic. Like you, maybe they could have like an elevated status so that you people will have like you know a, a level of importance above what maybe the the typical girl who places second at the team universe in bikini. A, yeah, you know, gets. like like almost grades like the military. You know, to have you know you end your you're a pro, and then you can have levels of being pro. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. That's a tremendous idea. But I, I don't. I don't think they're giving away too many pro cards. I think what it does is is if is if the public knows you have a good shot of getting a pro card because you have so many different divisions in which you can compete, and the and the ability to gain the pro card is is a little more liberal, as in giving it to the first and second place finisher of a class rather than just the overall winner. Um, it, it makes it a little easier to get a pro card, but I think a, a little bit easier to get a pro card might attract more people. You know, oh, it definitely will. It definitely yeah. will. There's no doubt about that, and I know that's why they're doing it. I just wonder if you know, you know, the Kevin Lavroni, if he makes a comeback, is, is standing, you know, next to <laughs> Mrs. Uh, Jones, who just got her master's bikini pro card. You know, it kind of like, you know, it, it, it kind of waters down the whole prestige of it. I yeah, feel. that's the other that's the other side of the, the edge of the sword is it is it is it does that. But I think if you did look, I, I think even just qualifying it, look, I'm a male pro bodybuilder that yeah. that's that's more prestigious than, you know, I'm, I'm a pro bikini competitor. Just just in title alone, one owns more prestige than the other. But I think I like your idea of having, you know, an elite status. And, and, and the ability to reach an elite status, uh, you know, in, in competition, I think is a great thing because, you, like you said, you know, you've got guys like Kevin Lavroni or, who are, you know, a veteran wanting to make a comeback. His perspective is good, definitely going to be a little bit skewed because his pro card meant a whole lot more back in the day than, than maybe it means today. But I think, Dave, down to the bottom line, if you got a pro card in your hand, that's, that's a pretty good thing. So uh, watered down or not, I, I think the prestige of ha having one is, is always going to be what it is. And I think the more chances they offer people to grab them, the better it is for everybody. Where do you see bodybuilding going in 5, 10, 15 years from now, especially with a lot of the, the, the newest, best talent going into men's physique? Because it's a lot easier to obviously get a pro card and to, uh, you know, especially if you have terrific genetics. It's almost like you can go right in there and get a pro card in less than a year. Do you see that the bodybuilding talent pool diminishing? Mm, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen with the men. Um, you know, the, the, the top pro men. I, I see more physiques now kind of getting distorted. You know, the, the, the guts are getting bigger and harder to control. The mass is just getting, you know, a, a little bit 
it, 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 and it goes along with the judging. I mean, if you have if you have unbridled mass with little regard for aesthetic and lines, and that's being rewarded over you know guys that are you know maybe not as big but have uh, you know can still hit a vacuum shot and have a little tiny waist but are still freaky huge on top. Um, it, you know, I think if it, it depends on where the you know, it depends on where the ideal lies. If, the, if but you start. but you see less people who are talented going into bodybuilding now and going towards men's physique. I mean, you get you look at guys like Jason Poston and Sadiq Hodzovic and and Jeremy Buendia. Imagine putting 30, 40 pounds of muscle on those guys. They'd be some terrific bodybuilders. Those are guys that might have been bodybuilders had this men's physique division not been there. You know, right. and, um, are we losing? the best talent to the men's physique division is my question. You know, maybe not, you know, maybe and maybe not. I mean, I think, you know, the, the men's open bodybuilding is always going to be the arena for, you know, if you think you're capable of building a freak, that's where it's going to go. Yeah. I, I would still like to see the dimensions and the lines of that controlled a little bit by judging standards that reward, you know, aesthetics over, over just mass so that, you know, we can start forcing these gurus to, to control the guts that are sticking out and, you know, correct the mistakes that they're making and, and hone men's bodybuilding into something that is as attractive to the guys who are predisposed for it, you know, for their genetic potential to pursue it rather than compromise what their genetic potential might be and go down to, you know, men's physique, even though it's, it's more popular. I still think there's going to be a, a, a spectator market for big freaky guys, but you got to have it together. You can't be big freaky and sloppy. So I, I think they're going to, you're going to see it. I think you're going to see men's physique eclipse men's bodybuilding in terms of popularity, notoriety, prestige, and, 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 and marketability. But I, I think bodybuilding played right is is going to still be the, the the top of the top and it should be so i think y you need to be able to segregate these divisions into definable car categories where you know a guy can easily see or a girl can easily see where they fit what the criteria is what the ideal is what they should shoot for and have the judging support uh you know those those ideals and th those criteria so no one is confused right. if they can do that then i think status quo in terms of the, the classes will continue. They may even add a few more, like you just said, yeah. and that'll be better for everybody. But I think men's bodybuilding, the future of men's bodybuilding is, is not solid right now. And I think it needs to be, you know, uh, I think attention needs to be paid to the end result because uh, ultimately I think it, it, it is a possibility. It could go by the way of women's bodybuilding. Yeah. Speaking of men's bodybuilding, big Rami, happens to be the, the newest, greatest freak, maybe of all time that we've ever seen. I mean, he has to be comparis I, compared with the likes of Ronnie Coleman in terms of size, mass, and, and symmetry. Yeah. Um, w do you see this guy becoming Mr. Olympia at some point? What, what's your a take on him? Absolutely. I, I, think, I think he is... When I saw him come on the scene, you know, what, two years ago, a year and a half ago, whenever I first noticed him, two years ago, I said, this guy has got it. And... You know, he's still a little green. He had, you know, he had to get fix his gyno and he had, you know, some other problems. I think he's probably working with, was he working with George Farah? That's a big mistake. Yeah, well, he was working with Chris for six months and then he, and then he somehow, uh, George, you know, bamboozled him over to his camp. We don't really know what, what went on, but uh, obviously he did the Arnold Brazil under George's guidance. Wasn't in the best conditioning. We've seen him, but he's so big and freaky that, and I will tell you this with a, absolute certainty there was no doubt that he deserved to win that show even right. though cedric mcmillan was his best that's how good rami is yeah look cedric's an awesome bodybuilder he's got great lines great proportions but you know bodybuilding at the top level is a freak show and i mean freak in a good way not not, not in a bad way um and it, it's it's it is what it is. That's what it's supposed to be. And and you know, every now and then we get a guy. You know, we got, you know, we had Arnold, then we had Haney, then we had Dorian, then we had Ronnie. Th these guys personified what the larger than life freak is. And as we move up, you know, the ladder, and you know, where are we going to go after after Ronnie Coleman? I don't think Phil Heath. Although you know, I like the guy. I think he's got a great physique, but I don't. Phil Heath was not the, the guy to pass the torch to in terms of who the next biggest freak is. And that's clearly, you know, Big Rami. Yeah. So 
I, I'd like to see him be able to, you know, c- c- you know, get a hold of himself, f- refine that. And look, that guy has got every piece you need to be Mr. Olympia for, for a long time to come. I, I think that this is a guy, if he's managed correctly and, you know, he doesn't get bad advice and ruin his physique, I, I think you're going to see a guy that's just unbeatable. I tell these guys, drying hard, drying hard. I don't know what they don't <laughs> listen. Yeah, I was at the Chinese buffet. I, I went there. He's, he's all bloated. <laughs> drying hard, I tell him. Drying, drying hard. hard. You know what? You know what? You know what? Uh, this is a true story. You know what Blackman told um, Evan Santapani to help him bring up his legs? <laughs> this is true. He told him, you got to do tourniquet training. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my so, God. No, but I, I'm serious. That's without a doubt, 100% accurate. Blackman told Santapani he's got to do tourniquet training with his legs. <laughs> Bro, I, I was I was in, a, in a, one of the famous steak dinners with uh, Billy Smith. Remember Billy Smith? Yeah, uh, the American Gladiators. Yeah, yeah. Blackman said, yeah, uh, "What was his name on Gladiators? I forgot." Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but anyway, Thunder, 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 Billy Thunder Smith from Gladiators. This, here's a guy who's who we were sitting the night we were sitting there having dinner. He probably weighed two ninety. OK, and and Blackman, who weighed, you know, 132, <laughs> with a 16 inch neck, they called me Cro-Magnon, um, t- sitting there telling Billy Smith how he how he trains his legs, that how he squeezes and he's and he squeezing and, he, and when it, and every rep like squeeze. And it looks like he was taking a shit because his eyes were all Chinese. And, you know, and he's talking about squeezing and Billy Smith is still <laughs> looking and goes, what the fuck is this guy talking about? <laughs> it was like one of those moments where you feel so embarrassed for knowing this person, you know? The, the best story you told me was when you used to work out with him and he, he read an article. Because what, what Steve would do is he would read an article and then whatever the article is, he would then – that would be his right. new dogma, his new like a jargon for the, for the next like you know six weeks. And you told me he read an article about muscle damage training. Remember that? Yeah. That muscle story? damage Oh, what and he was slamming the. Oh, and he, he was on the uh, the preacher curl, and he was slamming the bar down. He was letting the the bar fall and then catch it right at the right at the end, and you could see his bicep tendon snap out and almost hit the wall. And <laughs> and he's yeah, da- muscle damage, muscle damage. I go, you're not damaging your muscle, you're damaging your tendons. What are you doing? And then you know, two weeks later, he he he, he can't you know move his tongue for the grievous pain <laughs> in his elbows that he's got tendonitis so bad he can't he can't wipe his ass. Yeah, yeah. In another article, you tourniquets. You know, now was that his arm that you sent me that picture of with a little golf ball t- balled up in yeah, the middle of it's, it? Asphyxiation training. Asphyxiation training. <laughs> I can just see it. I always said to us, you know, I said, can you imagine you, you go into the gym and you, they find this guy dead with a noose around his neck and they're like, did he hang himself? And, he's like, and then you see this article written by Steve Blackman, you know, tourniquet training. Like someone thought that you put a tourniquet around your neck and you squat with it, you know. It's so funny how he would just the, – the dogma of the day is what I yeah. would call it. Oh, yeah. You know, he, I, you know, you go to dinner with him and, you know, one day he's got – he's making the – you know, he get waiters in the restaurant jumping like flies because, you know, he tips so good. <laughs> so And they're deathly afraid of losing a cent. I, I, I chop garlic. I, I, it's, the Journal of, you know, Sports Prostate Hyperplasia of Anatomist uh, not Journal. Yeah, I'm sure you saw the article this morning. <laughs> raw garlic. Yeah, raw garlic. And, you know, so the, the waiter, he's got to bring him a, a plate of chopped raw garlic and he's spreading it on his bread, you know, and eating it. And it's like, I didn't know what it was when I first saw it. I thought it was like like hummus or something. And I put it on the, I, t- I taste it. I go, this is raw garlic. What are you doing? He goes, Dad, I eat. And then the next day training with me stunk like a, like a, ugh, like a garbage truck with all the garlic coming out of his pores. Then, you know, two weeks later, it's olive oil. Olive oil is so good for you. So the guy at the Greek diner, he's pouring olive oil all over everything, like soup, like ladling it out. And then two weeks that two weeks after that, olive oil's no good. So then he says everybody that he goes out to eat, no, no oil. I'll go into anaphylactic shock and my tongue will swell. You know. <laughs> you remember, you remember when he <laughs> what the, after the other? It's like can you make up your mind? The Codfather. You remember the Codfather, Dale Alexander. <laughs> 
<laughs> cod father. Cod liver oil. Cod liver oil. Uh, oh, how about Vino Viagra? <laughs> Yeah, he he was up on his research. I'll give him that much. But yeah, you, he 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 wallowed like the wind. He would go back and forth. One back day forth, fish oil man. was good. The next day it was no good for bodybuilding. And uh, you know, was uh, what, 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 what was this thing that uh, the future of bodybuilding was going to be something? Uh, interleukin six. Interleukin. Interleukin six. The future of bodybuilding. <laughs> Oh, we could, God. you know, it, it never gets tiring talking no, about that. No, no. Yeah, and, and I and I tell people all the time, you know, I I do respect what he did teach us because he did teach us a lot of stuff. He he is a smart guy. He's just wacky when it comes to like, you know, he's so logical and so smart in one sense, and then in another sense, he's completely retarded. It's 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 he he's a bad people person. Yes, is what it is. He's, he needs to be locked in a room and just give yes. ideas to people. That, that's yes. what he really needs to do. He that's his no best. no sense of loyalty, no sense of respect, no sense of uh, you know humility. He he's he, he uses people. Remember what we used to go through getting people paid that you know Denise would say to check is on his desk. Well, he owed he owed. Uh, I'm not going to say who he owed, even though I already revealed it. But he owed a few people like four months back salary, you know, and they hadn't gotten it. I know Guy Sistanino was owed money. Oh, there it goes, slipped out. Yeah. And George <laughs> Farrow was owed four months. And actually, George came up to me at the in the lounge at the um, Arnold Brazil. We were in the Rio de Janeiro airport. He's like. Brother, why do you say this on the air? I, I tell you in privacy. I said, you don't tell me anything in privacy. If you're telling it to me, you want me to re reveal it. I said, let me ask you this. Did you get paid? He's like, yes. Yeah, he finally paid me. I said, well, where's my commission? I said, because my find is fake. <laughs> These guys, they all complain that like they tell me something, and then I reveal it, and then they, when they, then when they benefit from it, they you know they don't they don't even do anything to thank me. Send me a uh, send me some roses or a box of chocolate or something like that. Something. Now, now, where did where did this guru wars come from? This is what happened. Chris George Farrett, who I happen to, I don't know if I respect him as much as I, I respect his intelligence. He's accomplished a lot. He makes money. He's got a lot of athletes. However, he gets them is up to you know that that's his shtick. But he, he people he's a pathological he's, liar. He's, but he's a pathological liar. That's the problem. And he. Uh, lies about everything, you know. He, you know, he lied about Shot. being a police cop and, and and the whole thing, and you know. So what happened was he likes to go behind Chris's clients' back, like backstage before they get on stage, and right before they're about to go on stage, he's like, "Brother, you work with me. I give you secrets, and you win show." Like, like in other words, like they look like shit backstage. Like he does it right before they go out, Ow. and then when Chris confronts them because these people tell him he lies, and he said, "I never say that. I only kidding." You know, but he's not. So Chris confronted him in the lounge, and George was lying and, and tried to give this, like, half-hearted apology. Now, the video I put up was only, like, half of what was really said. Uh, they didn't realize it was going to be as good as it was, and that's why I, I started filming halfway through. Chris okay. was a little upset that George was giving him an insincere apology because he knows that George, cause George is still in the, was denying that he, he tries to steal Chris's clients. And, you know, Chris takes – very, very big pride in, in, in what he does and helping people. He doesn't have a million clients. He has about 10 or 12 clients, and he doesn't need George, you know, harassing him backstage. So George was lying about it. So Chris is like, you know what? I don't accept your apology. And that's how the whole thing got started. Uh -huh. And then, you know, and then George is like, I don't lie. And then Chris is like, are you a cop? That's where the whole thing came from. And then <laughs> George, I guess, to deflect from the whole cop thing, because he knows that's a sore subject, said to Chris, oh, are you gay? You know, to try to, like, you know, throw him off his game. Yeah. And then when Chris said, "No, I'm not gay. Are you a cop?" and then then the whole thing started, and then you know, and then it got she out of here. Stepped in. Yeah. But you know, like I said, I thought it was to me. See, I don't take anything personally, so to me, I thought it was hysterically funny. Even if I was the guy involved, I would be think it's funny now. But some people get, you know, George was offended by it, and I, I, you know, I'm sorry if he was offended, but um, it is what it is. And you know, sometimes you don't really see brutal honesty like that. A lot of people texted and emailed me saying we love the video, not because of the funniness of it, but because it was real. Right, it was real. And a lot of times, you know that, John, and we've gotten in trouble for doing too much real stuff, you know, because yeah. sometimes you cross the line when you do that. But real is really what people want. Isn't that why reality TV is so big today? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> look at Bruce Jenner. Right. Well, the, the problem with bodybuilders is they have no sense of humor. So no one wants right. to reveal what they, who they truly are. So everyone's a bunch of fake phonies on the outside. And the real deep stuff 
never gets out. And that's really what would make the people rally behind you. That's what would make people, you know, to want to listen to you. I think the reason why Heavy Muscle Radio has been so successful over the years when you were there and then when Chris took over is because we, we, we it's real stuff. I Definitely. tell you what I'm doing in my life. I tell you all the, the, stu- the stupidness when I drop something on my head. You know, I don't hold anything back. And you never did that. And Chris doesn't do that. And right. people like that because it, it's authentic. Yeah, but Fer- Ferry used to piss me off when he would be in a show and, he, and th- th- there would be a guy, he doesn't even know who he is, who's obviously going to do very well, maybe win the class. He'd say, hey, hey, what's that guy's name? And then he'd, he'd, somebody tell him, and he'd stand up and he'd go, yeah, Joe, that's it. Yeah, squeeze, st- sit on the leg. That's, it's flesh your calves, blow out your abs. So it sounds like he's the coach. He still does, he still does that. Still doing that? Yeah, the only <laughs> – the only difference nowadays is I don't Blackman doesn't like you know whoop it up from the crowd anymore like he used to do it. Actually, I haven't seen him at a show in a long time. So you oh Blackman doesn't go to shows anymore. No, I haven't seen him anymore. I very rarely. I think he goes to the Arnold. Remember when he used to sit in the crowd and be like woo? You know, uh, ogling. Remember him? He would, he, would, he would like you know Evan sent the ponies on stage. He's staring at his glutes, going crazy. Yeah. And then the women are on, and he's down writing. You know, or he leaves when the women go on. <laughs> Uh, I don't think maybe his wife doesn't allow him to go because, you know, homo's out. support the women of the sport. He he told me one time all of the women in the NPC and the IFBB are ugly. (laughs) All of them. There's there's, there's like thousands of them. There's not one good looking They're all ugly. Yeah. Unbelievable. But, Look, you know, you know, you know going I'm back, more, I, I'm, John, I got to be honest with you. I'm worried about the industry. I am not from the perspective of the competition because I think the competing and the promoters are doing great because I think more and more people are competing. I'm worried about the how it's being covered now because you know what? The magazines have fallen off. There's no the advertising dollars are not there. I feel like the supplement companies are not doing as well as they were. There's too many companies competing with each other for the same piece of the pie, and the athletes are losing endorsement contracts from both the advertisers. And the magazines, and I think there's a big deficit of there's, there's a big loss of money in this in this industry, and and people just don't have the money they had, you know, ten years ago, five years ago when we were really in I would say the heyday, and I don't know where it's going to go. I, I I I see bad things happening when you see companies like Rich Gasparri declaring bankruptcy, Ultimate Nutrition declaring bankruptcy, um, you know, VPX being bought by Champion. You know, th- th- this it's not the same industry that we knew five years ago. Well, no, Dave, and it, you know, I, I don't think it ever will be. I mean, you know, go look back to the days of, you know, when we had EAS and and you and uh, Unipro, um, what was it, Unipro and um, Metrex. Remember, I mean, the industry evolves. The you know, the giants are going to get bigger. You know, you got you the know, difference com- was back then there was ten companies. Nowadays, there's there's, there's 180 companies. You know, but the but the the bigger ones are getting bigger. I mean, look at you got a protein company like Glambia bu- buying up supplement companies, yeah, it's PSN it's and Optimum Nutrition. Sure. So you're going to have what we're going to end up with is just like the computer companies. You're going to end up with two or three giants, and then you're going to have, uh, you know, they're going to they're going to soak up what's. What's left? But you know what? The advertising dollars. There's a ton of money in this industry. It, it may be spread out now, but between more companies than before. But the big fish are still big fish, and you know you get you get these companies that can that can pull in you know in the hundred million a year bracket. These guys are not supporting the the media outlets the way they should be yeah. and, and have more of a hold on it because, like it or not, these media outlets us. We we support the industry in a way no one else does because we're giving we give immediate co- we give immediate uh, 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 visuals immediate voice to everything that's going on right now at this yeah. time. Yeah. So, you know, politics has the news. Bodybuilding needs its media outlets just the same, and they need to be supported. And uh, you know, huge companies that are raking in these gigantic dollars. You know, even at the expense of soaking up small companies or putting them out of business, these big companies need to be putting more money into I don't know where they're putting their money that's what I want to know where are they spending their money I don't think they're spending it it. you know what happens is when these companies get really big they hire outside executives now you get a you get a a company let's without naming any names let's call it XYZ supplement company who's who's buying 60 pages of ads in one magazine now they, they, you know, they've grown to a point where they hire a CE, CFO that used to be with, you know, you know, Acme Trading Company, you know, some giant, you know, uh, Fortune 500 company. Now they're working in the supplement industry and they're saying, 
what are you doing buying 60 pages in one magazine? We put right. one page in, 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 a, in a magazine. That's the extent of you know what we're going to put into a magazine. Sure. So they, they bring these ideals from other industries into our industries and try to run them that way. But the problem is it doesn't always work. Yeah. Right? There's got to be, be a bigger synergy between the supplement companies, the athletes they support, and the media outlets that promote them. And, and it's got to be a, a more of a cohesive arrangement with these entities because if not, the supplement companies are going to get hurt in the long run because less people are going to be aware of what their stuff is. I can't believe that more companies are not advertising on you know, rxmuscle.com, musculedevelopment.com, <laughs> flexonline.com, NPC News on time. Those are the top four. I mean, media websites. I mean, if you, I mean, if you're not advertising there, I mean, where the hell are you spending your money? I mean, that's where 99% of the people go for 99% of their information every single day. Right. I know. I see the statistics. But but what what's not, what's what's not happening? And this is what I learned when I you know was 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 marketing with that uh, fish oil company for the year. What these companies are not doing. The media companies are not doing what RX is not doing, what Flex is not doing, what, what what none of them are doing is that they're not engaging the advertiser with with digital marketing strategies that 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 facilitate sales. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, you know, they're reading metrics off the back end off Google Analytics and they're they're counting eyeballs, but they're not converting these eyeballs to sales right. because no one knows how to do it. Yeah, I know right. how to do it. <laughs> but you know you've got you've got to have these you've got to have a digital marketing strategy to sell to the advertiser to prove to him that advertising with your media site brings in money. Right. And you know there's ways of doing that, but right now they're looking at they're looking at you know you got bean counters from other industries looking at our metrics and saying why advertise with them? We all all we get is views. We don't get any money. Right. Yeah. That's that's an interesting uh, definitely insight without a doubt. But uh, I think we're gonna we're running a little low on time here. We're gonna have to wrap this up, but hopefully we'll be able to do many, many, many more parts with John in the future. Uh, we'll have hey, to I see. Just wanna, I just, yeah. just want to say one thing before we go, and yes. with respect to what we opened the show with. I mean, when we talked about the industry and my problems with the powers that be, I do want to say this, and I think this is very important. My wife Valerie turned pro at the nationals this year, taking second in her class in physique. After qualifying only four weeks later, she was an absolute newcomer. And if 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 anybody was gonna hold, was gonna hold a grudge, that would have been the place to show it. And you know, she got her pro card fair and square. And uh, you know, it, it's testament, I think, to the fact that regardless of what personal animosities they may hold, you know, towards me, they did not take it out on my wife. And I think that's I, I think that's a really important thing for for uh you know the people to know is that when we're all talking about you know the judging is fixed and that the people are you know favoritism and this and that this was the exact opposite if anybody deserved to if anybody had to walk away with their tail between their legs at that at the nationals it would have been me it would have been us yeah and 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 that's not what happened it was judged fairly and you know i i, I think that means an awful lot yeah that does i mean that just goes to show that you know um you yeah, look you know, there's always bad decisions, you know, that people will think occurred. And I'll tell you this, there's not a lot of them every year, but there's a couple of them. And that's just, you know, personal preference. So, you know, just like there's presidential elections that are not popular, you know. Hey, ask, uh, Steve, ask Steve Weinberger who, what he thought of the 91 yeah. Ms. Olympia. Yeah, when Bev, when Bev got ripped off. Yeah, so I mean, it happens. But I think by and far, most of the decisions are pretty, pretty accurate and are pretty good. And you know, you know, like you said, if anyone was going to take out any animosity towards you, that that would have been the perfect time, and it wasn't done. So, um, you know, that that says a lot for the integrity of Jim Mannion. Exactly. And, and I, I wanted to make sure I got a chance to say that because that I, was. Uh, I think a big thing. I have a good quote. Um, I want to end the uh, segment with. I think it's uh, applicable. It's by Oscar Wilde. You probably know it. Yet each man kills the thing he loves. By each, <laughs> let this be heard. Some do it with a bitter look. Some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss. The brave man with a sword. Wow. Yep. John Ramada with a pen. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> John, it was great having you on, and uh, I, I hope to have many, many more interviews in the future with you. Uh, thank you for filling us in on your life and catching us up, and uh, we always love to hear your opinions. Yeah, well, it's it, it was it meant a lot to me to get back on the radio with you, Dave. We uh, we were pioneers in this in this version of media, and and uh, I always cherish my time. Uh, the, you know, we, we all the things that we created, all the things that we did. Uh, the be- that was the absolute best parts of my life. So uh, I'm I'm really hoping that we can uh, do more in the future. But if not, this was a great op- This was a great day. Well, I feel the same. We're gonna quit. Quit. We're gonna cut to a commercial break. We'll be right back. <laughs> 